Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, friends of Aruba. My name is Geert Koisa and I was asked to help moderate this uh, event today, uh, which pleases me very much since I've been a great friend of Aruba for quite some years now. Uh, I will gladly talk, you, talk to you sometime about the fantastic uh, things we've been doing with Green School on Aruba, but uh, the stage is absolutely not mine today. But what we do need to see is that this is the uh, second TEDx Aruba and it is of course a, a, a phenomenon that comes from the great transition that Aruba is going through and has been growing through. It has been positioning itself as a great example in transitioning towards energy neutrality but also towards a sustainable economy. And TEDx Aruba is proof once again that you cannot reach a sustainable economy without a knowledge-based economy. And all this knowledge coming in through and on Aruba is, is, is fantastic for me to see. And I only applaud every time I see a new move that Aruba has made, I am amazed at what they can do and how little others can do around the world. So let this once again be an inspiration to everybody. I would like to first give the word to the Minister of Plenipotentiary. <coughs> <laughs> I passed that test. <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Mr. Alfonso Buchhout, please give him a hand before. Him. That's my parking ticket. <laughs> and this is my speech. I've been uh, specifically asked this afternoon to stick to the notes because otherwise I will be talking two hours here and that's not the intention. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome, welcome partners of Aruba. We're very glad to have you this uh, afternoon here and I'm very glad also to see many, many of you who have responded uh, affirmative to our invitation to attend this uh, TEDx viewing event for your um, idea we are streaming it uh, all over in the in the embassies of the kingdom in south america um, um, north america and europe uh, so we have quite some viewers today so we hope the technique will uh, will be with us the, this afternoon as well it is the second uh, tedx of aruba but it is the first viewing event that we are doing here today so there are more uh, um, there are more events um, but we have put our own um, accent at our, our event this, this afternoon. Um, TEDx on itself is, um, as we are going to look at it today, is for us a recognition of we knowing that we cannot move forward without innovation. Um, we cannot move forward without having knowledge inspiring us to challenge the status quo. It, uh, it, but it also confirms that uh, as Aruba, we are a front runner um, when it comes to sustainability based on a concrete vision. A vision that promotes not only um, energy transition, but also promotes social inclusion and innovation and education. And of course, also a sound doses of practice <laughs> what you preach. It, it is a result of choices that the Aruban government has made to put the island on the map as one of the most, most sustainable islands in the Caribbean. So it takes courage, determination and perseverance for a small island to embody such a big vision. But we do it with a lot of passion and believe that small islands can provide a solution when it comes to the energy transition challenges there, there are in the world. So Aruba is thankful that it got help from many international partners on this vision, that we have people who support us in this vision. People like our friends from TNO, from Philips, from the United Nations, from Carbon War Room, Rocky Mountain Institute. Um, but the most important part of this journey is that the government had to create awareness under its own people, its own population. So in fact, we still see the need to continue with this endeavor. We must not stop until the last part of the population has embraced the transition to a sustainable way of life. 
The theme of this year's TEDx is what if, and there's nothing more direct in challenging the status quo than to ask yes, but what if? It's an open question um, that we all need to think about and draw a conclusion as to what we want to do. We cannot just keep doing what we've been doing for the past 20 years and expect to be ready for the next 20 years. So we need to think on what development needs to be enabled and which actions are worth doing in order to cope with what the challenges are that we're going to be facing. It will be interesting to hear the speakers address the issues during the session that we will be ha having to today through the live stream. But we also have an interesting part of our own program, an interesting talk today that um, our friends from EBS will be addressing. So this event wouldn't be a success if we didn't have our friends of EBS here today too. So thank you, Mr. Alexander and Suma for being part of our program today. And, um, but also thank you, Mr. Geert Koistra for uh, being willing to moderate this for today. And so you complete our dream team. <laughs> um, but last, uh, um, but not least, I would like to thank our own employees from the cabinet that uh, made this organization possible. Um, also, thank you to ATA, the ATA team that has become part of my own team. <laughs> uh, so for salary raise, you can come to me <laughs> from now on. So I'm very pleased to see what we are able to achieve when we combine forces. It is also what we think that will move on, move us forward towards the challenge that we're going to be facing as an island with a clear vision uh, towards sustainability. Um, maybe just an explanation. We decided to do it in English because the streaming is, will also be in English. So that's why we have decided to do it in English this afternoon. Um, but of course, we all love our Dutch language. But thank you for being here. And um, we hope you will have a very pleasant program this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Plenipotentiary. <laughs> <laughs> well, only one thing I want to add to that, since Rubens continue to amaze me also by their modesty. You say one of the most sustainable islands in the Caribbean. Come on. It's one of the most sustainable <laughs> nations in the world. <laughs> it, con it considers to fill me with pride to, to be at least sometimes part of that. So I'm glad to, to add to your team. What if is, of course, also about dreaming what could be. And I think uh, some people don't stop there. And that's when you see the big successes happen. And our guest speaker, I, I must say beforehand that we are, cannot be, it's a live event, so we cannot be exactly sure when we have to switch to Aruba. So I'll keep my mouth shut as much as possible and continue to introduce Mr. Alexander Suma. I will also have to read something about you, since I am not very good at memorizing. Mr. Suma is a true business leader, and he has a background as a civil engineer and a structural engineer, but also as an architect. And it's exactly that combination that makes him very inventive. Um, and he is uh, the inventor of a means called Power Nest. There's plenty brochures to be found here. <laughs> Just uh, have a talk with uh, Buren over there. He is desperate to get rid of some of those. <laughs> but it is, of course, one of the major uh, 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 solutions to look at aesthetically um, uh, responsible solutions for wind power. I mean, we th those that know Aruba from inside know also the struggle that Father Pete had. Uh, the windmills, uh, and we all know the, the protests that we have all around the world against, well, what is it, vision pollution. But uh, Mr. Suma is not a quitter, he's a continuer, and he invented the, this, um, this, this beautiful uh, uh, tool. And um, he's also a true businessman, because he raises businesses from scratch. And, the, well, the last business I, I have here in Word, uh, within two years it was? from zero to 26 employees and up to 1.4, I don't know the valuta, maybe dollars, million dollars, Euro. euros even. Look at how successful, I wish I could say that. <laughs> uh, 
and his current company is Ibis or Ibis? Ibis Power. Uh, but but I, I will I will let you tell the the people themselves. Uh, and it, it is the company that sells uh, the, the the power nets, right? Well, let me not talk too much because I read here one more thing that you're also an inspirator, motivator and strategic decision maker as well as a visionary leader. So show us. Okay. <laughs> a hand for Mr. Alexander Zuma, please. Thank you, Kit, for raising the bar that <laughs> high. I don't think it fits in the room anymore. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Kit. Hi, I'm Alexander Suma, and um, what I'd like to share with you today is an, an example of what if that started seven years ago, and I think has the potential, um, well, to change Aruba in a renewable energy way, the Netherlands, and really has the potential to change the whole world in that sense. Um, so I'd like to take you back to Miami in uh, 2007 and um, yes, there we go. And this was the street I was actually living at the time. I was doing my PhD at the University of Miami and I was living in the house on the right. And I lived here for one year and after one year I went back to the Netherlands. I kind of went on vacation back to the Netherlands. I think the Rubens know how that feels. <laughs> and. Um, and, and so I, I got my luggage, I turned off the air conditioning, and I went to the airport. And even before reaching the airport, my landlady, she called me and she said, why the hell did you turn off the air conditioning? Are you out of your mind? And I was like, well, I have to pay that bill, and it's not so good for the environment, right? Um, but apparently it had something to do with mold and, and the humidity and the temperature, etc. I wasn't aware. So I, I came back to Miami and I walked through this street. It was a 10 minute walk to the university. And I, as I walked there, I heard in all these houses, I heard, heard these fans running. And I thought, this is insane, 24 seven, this whole street, but the whole of Miami, which are 6 million people, are using the air conditioning. That's like a huge amount of energy being drained through the grid. It was insane, I thought. Well, at the same moment, if you, and many people, I think, here know Miami, well, it's a subtropical climate. There is so much sun, there is always enough wind, it basically is boosted with energy. So I thought there has to be a better solution. And I was always taught in, in, in the university to design a building to protect it against its outside weather conditions, basically a bunker. And then the what if came to my mind and I thought, what if I break with that tradition and I have the building and I let it collaborate and exchange uh, energy with its direct environment. And that was the first thought that I had when I uh, wanted to lift up the roof, put a turbine, funnel the wind through that turbine and cover it with solar panels. And of course it had to be um, aesthetically pleasing, but that was, that was the first thought. So this was the first sketch I made. I know it's not pretty. <laughs> But this is how it started. And a few weeks later, I, I came to this idea. It's, it's round because I wanted to have the wind come from any direction. Um, but this was part of uh, the poster that I made because I wanted to take this to a conference in Hawaii. Yes, that was nice. Um, <laughs> and, and this was part of it. And I showed it to um, Bar Chernoff. And he was the vice Provo provost of technology transfer. And I met him at a lunch and I showed him my poster and he immediately locked the door and he said, and, and he called the director of uh, the department and uh, a patent officer. And he said, you can't even tell your mom about this. And within five years, uh, five years, you're going to be a millionaire. Still need to give him a call about that. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but he kept his word. So immediately we went into a patent process. Uh, one week later, I was with a uh, patent attorney. Uh, three weeks later, I was on the stage for angel investors and they coached me all along the way. And um, I got a team of, uh, of researchers, uh, including professors, while I was a student, so that was also exciting. And, and we developed it for two years uh, there, really did all the fundamental research. Um, so that was seven years ago. Um, to give you to well, I don't think I have seven years for this talk. So. Um, to give you a little bit an idea what happened in those seven years. So it, it, everything started in Miami 
we did a lot of things there, also got awards. Um, yes, in 2012, we got an award from Jim at the TEDx Amsterdam, right? <laughs> and um, so we, we came to the Netherlands, uh, we got support from the European Union, from uh, Dutch uh, subsidy institutions to develop this. And we got really um, a lot of attention. And, um, and so we did all the product development in these last years. And this is just to give you an idea in those seven years of how many people are needed to bring an innovation to reality. And these are all people that really contributed for months. So it's not, there's way more people who helped for weeks or just gave their time in different ways, but all these people helped for months. So that's a huge amount of people to make something a reality. Um, and then just in, in June, this past June, uh, we opened the first one, um, so we got the, the support from the European Union to, to do this. Um, and, and this was a, a big event for us because we could finally show the world that uh, everything that we've been saying and predicting these last seven years is the reality. And so this was a, an, how do you call it, a technology breakthrough. But it's more than a technology breakthrough because, um, let me first explain you how it works a little bit. So what you, can, what you today have is if you want to put solar on a building, you can go up to three levels of a building to make it energy neutral because you have a limited um, space uh, on the roof to put solar panels. Solar panels need, need a lot of area. So what we do is we lift that complete area up and we go also a little bit to the outside and we can use 120% of the roof area and then use that same space again for wind. And in this way we can uh, generate three times more energy than you could do with just only solar panels. And, and why is this a market breakthrough? Because if you look at buildings, and these are numbers for the Netherlands, what you can do today with solar is that you can provide for a five-story building 50% of the building. But if you use Power Nest, you can go way higher. And if, you, if it's in an inland location, if you go to the coast where you have much more wind, you can provide this amount of energy of a building. So this means that high-rise buildings can become energy-producing buildings. And if you think that it was until today only able to provide energy to three-level buildings, now up to 10-level buildings. So that's a big change. So these pictures may look familiar to you. This is uh, the Playa Linda in Aruba. I was there two weeks ago. And, and uh, we're going to start with the penthouse there in the top and another uh, next to the building. Um, this is the Marriott, um, the surf club. And, and as you can see, it integrates very well uh, with the building. They called it, it's like we have another penthouse on top. Well, that was a huge compliment. And uh, this is uh, a plan for uh, utility Aruba. And uh, we're still deciding whether it's going to be these four units or uh, one. So that's also a project in progress. Um, and just to give you some examples here in Rotterdam, uh, these are buildings that we can uh, completely bring, uh, make them energy neutral. And this is in the area of Omoort. And, and this is another example. Um, this would be 360 megawatt hours per year that uh, will be produced on top of the roof. And so far, we have been looking only at buildings. And I think any, every sustainable solution looks at buildings to make a building sustainable. Um, but I think we should go one step further and really think about neighborhoods, cities, and really implement at large. And I think this is something that we even have to do to accelerate this tra transition enough. So, We've been working on this area in Rotterdam and we analyzed that there's 38 buildings that have a similar uh, construction um, uh, texture. And what we can do, we, if we implement on all these buildings a power nest, and we're already discussing with parties to actually do this, we could produce 10.8 gigawatt hours per year in this area. And that's a huge amount. And it would look like this. So I, I think this is a little picture of the future, I hope. And, but what is the impact for the environment? So with these 10.8 gigawatt hours, 
you could provide 4,910 apartments and you could, that would be the equivalent of um, a, a traffic line of 15 kilometers of, uh, of cars. So that's a huge impact. And I think in Rotterdam, there's already enough traffic lines so we can miss one in terms of carbon footprint. <laughs> so to conclude my, my talk, um, um, well, me and, and my team at Ibis Power, we've been working for seven years to bring an idea from scratch to a solution for society. And, and I think also in society, we've been always saying in the future, we need to be sustainable. And those things coming together, I would like to conclude with saying that the future is now. Thank you.